Well, good morning and welcome to our new building. Woohoo! I can't wait to worship with you here on our grand opening service in a two weeks, October 6th. Services at 9 o'clock and 10.45 a.m. My name is Kevin. I am the lead pastor of Connect Us Church. I'm going to put this name tag on and you'll figure out why in just a second. But I can't believe it. We're here in this new building, and I can't wait to be here in person with you very, very soon. But we just finished, as a church, about five months' worth of verse-by-verse preaching through the Gospel of John, which is incredible. And I don't know about you, but I really, really enjoyed this series. Looking at Jesus seeing him so clearly, so perfectly, so beautifully. It's just amazing to focus so uniquely on Jesus and seeing how John is telling us that he is so much better than what was. That Jesus is the new wine. Jesus is the colorful. Jesus is the tasteful. Jesus is the so much better than that old bland blah ritual water. And Jesus changed into wine and said, there is something new, something exciting, something life-giving coming your way, and it's here. And he was looking at the temple, and as beautiful and as awesome as the temple was, Jesus made it clear that he is the temple. He's so much better. We're looking at the religious leaders, the rabbis, the Pharisees, the people in charge, the priests, those things, and the the genealogies and the studying and the memorizing and all those things that they put value in, Jesus looked at them and said, look, you've got to be born again. There's something new that's happening here. Or the sacred spaces, the, the sacred places, the sacred wells, Jesus goes and says, I am the living one. He is so much better than what was. And it was just a beautiful thing to look at that, to see that Jesus is better than Hanukkah. Jesus is better than the Festival of Booths. It's just amazing to see that. And I was also just struck and challenged by the stories of life change that we read in the Gospel of John, where Jesus tiptoes through the crowd and finds this guy who was paralyzed for 38 years. And he walks right past everybody else that kind of needed help, and he finds this guy, and he asks him the question, hey, do you want to get well? And the other guy had an answer. He said, well, you know, there are people that help other people, but I don't have anybody to help me. He was believing something about this superstition that if he could get into the water, then he could maybe be healed. But who... Who made that up? Why did he believe that? And there was nobody. He had nobody to help him. But Jesus showed up in his life and radically changed his life. But I just, as I think about this guy, as I think about who he was, as I think about what he was dealing with, he had a name tag too. I think he had an identity that was something along the lines of, Not good enough. And I can relate to that. I think we all can relate to that. As he was sitting there and saying, well, everybody else gets it. Everybody else has all these people that help them, and I don't have anybody. I'm not good enough. I must not be good enough for them. You know, I go to that job interview, and there's five people that are interviewed, and four people get the job, and not me. Not good enough. Or you those friends that get together and they're celebrating and they, they post the pictures all over the social media and I wasn't invited. Not good enough. We're playing sports, right? They get the spot on the team and I don't. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to get the grades that my parents want me to get in school. I'm not good enough. This whole idea is, a, is an identity. It's a who he is, it's a, I can't do this, it's a, I'm not good enough to do this, for whatever reason. 
And I think about the other guy that we met. That Jesus showed up in his life, radically transformed his life, but he was blind from birth. And you know, God made, he didn't do this, you know, this God made our eyes to see. You're watching this right now, most likely. Maybe you're listening to it, that's cool too. But you can watch this with your eyes. They were made to see. And so when they don't see, well, something's wrong. And this guy was trying to figure out, and, and his culture, his religion, they had a reason for why his eyes that were supposed to see couldn't see. It was either his fault or it was his parents' fault. Those were the only two options in their culture, in their world. And I think if, if he had to put a name tag on that described how he was doing and who he was, maybe he would write something like this. I blew it. I blew it. Like, I tried my best. And I can't do it. And again, I think we can all relate to this guy. We can relate to him feeling this way, that I blew it because I have blown it. You have blown it. Like, we've had opportunities in this world, in this life, and we've just wasted it. We, we've made the phone calls, we've set up the meeting, we got together, everything's perfect, we got the gift, we got this recent, we're praying and we're hoping that God's gonna restore the relationship and we get there and it's like, here comes this part and I gotta say it this way and I blew it. I blew it. We've made decisions, we've all made decisions that have led to uh, bad consequence. Maybe it's a, a decision that you made that led to the divorce. Maybe it's a decision that you made at work one day and your boss said, that's okay, you don't have to come back here ever again. You blew it. I blew it. We know what that's like. We know what that feels like. But these guys were operating in a world where their identity was something that was achieved. And I think that we all, many of us, operate in the very same world. We live in a culture and a world today that is hyper-focused on identity. And some of the hot-button topics and issues around identity have to do right now, so our world is talking about, our culture is talking about gender identity, we're talking about our sexual orientation identity. Like these things are, are celebrated. Uh, in a different kind of avenue there, we talk a lot in this world, in this culture today, about trying to destigmatize mental health. Which is great, you know, we need to talk about it. We've got to learn about it and be open about it, certainly. But many of you, if you ask, you know, how's it going, or what's up, or what's going on, you're like, well, I, I have anxiety. Oh, okay. Uh, or, or I have depression. And it's not just something that you have, it becomes an identity of who you are. And from my experience of people that have dealt with these things that, you know, you try to get help for, that's great. And, and if it doesn't work, if the help doesn't work, the medication doesn't work, then, well, I guess you don't have depression. I guess it's bipolar. And there's these, these constant labels that aren't just what we are, but they become who we are. And it becomes the identity in which we live. And you know, it is certainly helpful to have an understanding of who you are and the things that you deal with and think about and struggle with and how you feel and, and all of those things. Certainly helpful. But I'm here to remind us today. I'm here to remind us and tell us today that the best identity is one that is received and not achieved. The best identity is one that is received and not achieved. And the only one that can bestow upon you and bestow upon me an identity of who we are is the one that made you, is the one that purchased you with his blood. 
It's the most true identity that you could possibly have. And in the case of these two guys' stories of John that have just been rattling around in my mind and my heart for the last several months as we've been working through this stuff, these guys didn't even know who Jesus was when Jesus showed up into their life, when Jesus tiptoed through the crowd of people that were in need of help, but he landed on this guy who was paralyzed for 38 years and said, hey man, pick up your mat and walk. And Jesus walked. He left the building. He left the area. He disappeared. Or he comes up to this guy who was born blind. He puts blood on his eyes and disappears. But these guys did not achieve the thing that they received. They received it. They didn't even know the guy who was doing these things for him. They just stopped and received it. And I've been wondering a lot about these guys. And I've been wondering about us. I've been wondering about you. Have you received this identity that comes only from Jesus? Have you? And if not, why not? I hope you want that. And you can receive that right here and right now. Just pray something like, Lord Jesus, I need you. I, I want to receive everything that you have for me. I'm tired of achieving. I can't achieve. Jesus said, you died for me. You paid my penalty. I, I'm not even sure exactly what that means, but I just know I need you, and I need you to receive everything that you have for me. You can do that right here and right now. But for others of us who have received this new identity, I've been wondering, how's it going? How's it going? How are you doing with that? Because, you know, John tells us in his gospel, the couple moments that lead up to these radical transformations, and maybe they tell us the next day or two. But John doesn't tell us what happened in these guys' lives over the course of years, like five years from then, 20 years from then, maybe 50 years from then. I think about these guys, and I wonder, was the paralyzed guy who was paralyzed for 38 years, was he still carrying his mat through the temple, breaking the Sabbath rules 20 years later? Was he still doing that? Or what about the guy who was born blind? Because of this whole scenario, he was excommunicated. He was kicked out of the synagogue. But his parents chose to stay. And I wonder, how was their relationship? Did they talk to each other? Did they ever restore that relationship? How was it affected? I, I'm wondering, 5, 20, 50 years down the line of how this is going. Another guy we met in the Gospel of John, his name was Lazarus, the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. And Jesus told his friends to unwrap his grave clothes. But I wonder what they were thinking as they were unwrapping this guy. Were they thinking, there's going to come a time in the future, I don't know when, but there's going to come a time in the future where we are wrapping Lazarus again in grave clothes. How strange a thought to wonder that. I wonder if Lazarus lived every moment of his new life that he had, like it was his like absolute best life. Like every day he lived like it was his last, because he knew what it was like to have his last day here on the earth. I mean, he died once already. I wonder how often Lazarus went to go visit the tomb where his body was laid. Was he thinking every day? Wow, I mean, I know what it's like to die once. Maybe, maybe today's the day where it happens again. Transformation is not tight. New is not easy. Going from death to life 
has got to be the hardest thing in the world. I mean, going from life to death happens every day. Come on, moment. But going the other way, going from death to life, how do you even begin? How do you even start to do that? I wonder about these guys again, like how many years did it take for people to stop recognizing this guy who was paralyzed for 38 years as the guy who was paralyzed for 38 years and start recognizing him as a guy that was walking? How many years did it take for the guy who was born blind from birth to be recognized by people that, wow, he can see that? How many years did it take for people to stop thinking about Lazarus as the guy who was dead that came back to life and just start thinking about a guy who's normally alive? How many years? I think people forget, obviously, and, and people will change their mind or, or they will meet somebody new and they won't know the whole story. But I think it's extra difficult for people who do know the whole story. And there's one person who knows their individual story better than anybody else. And that's you. You know your story. I know my story. They know their story better than anybody else does. So I wonder, when does the paralyzed man stop telling the story of what it was like to be stuck in a location for 38 years and start telling the story of all the places his feet have taken him in his new life? When does the guy who was born blind stop talking about what it was like to live in darkness in a century where there was literally nothing for people that could not see or any other kind of handicaps and start talking about all the beautiful things that his eyes have seen in God's creation. When does Lazarus stop telling the story about when he died and start telling the stories of the impacts he has been making on people's lives with every breath he breathes. Again, it's not a black and white thing in this world. How you see yourself, who you are, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's a messy thing. It's a story. It's a new reality that we're given, and at the same time, we're stuck dealing with the same past. It's a hope for a future where all things are possible while knowing just moments ago, or days ago, years ago, that there is a past telling you that nothing is possible. But this is what it means to be Christian. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. To be a Christian means to change. To me, to be a believer means that new things are happening all of the time. Just like our church. We're moving into this new building in two weeks. It's new. It's exciting. But we will always be the church that started in the Real Sinners movie theater. This is how God operates. This is what real transformation looks like. God looks down onto this earth. And he was looking around at everybody that he could possibly pick and find. And he picked this old guy. This old, old guy. 
who was worshiping all these pagan gods. And he looked at this guy named Abram, and he said, you're going to be the father of many nations. And Abram, Abram's looking around, he's like, what are you talking about right now? Me? The father of many nations. Excuse me. Voice in the sky. God, I don't know who you are talking to me right now. The father of many nations. I'm not even a father of any kid, let alone nations. And I am old. It's not happening. I cannot be. And, and, and God looks at this man. This man, Abraham who can't believe anything of what God is saying is true. The circumstances tell him otherwise. Reality tells him otherwise. But he looks at him and says, no, you're going to be a father of many nations. You're going to have this new identity. I'm going to give you a new name. Abraham, the father of many nations. And Abraham, I just envisioned him struggling. How is this possible? Yes, you've given me this new thing, but it just doesn't look real in my life at all. But he wanted it to be. He wanted the new thing to be true about him. And so in a world that achieves identity, in a world that looks to make choices and make decisions and, and make, uh, achieve the identity that we want to have, Abraham said, okay, let me try that. God, you've said that I'm going to be the father of many nations. I don't have any kids right now, so I'm going to go sleep with someone who's not my wife because she can't have any children but maybe this other woman can for me and God I'm going to help you out we want to try to achieve this identity and God's like Come on. Abraham, Abraham, this is Abraham Genesis 15 verse 6, Abraham Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. This Abram had this new identity given to him by God, and he believed it. He was wrestling with what it meant to believe this new thing God had revealed to him. Well, this is a God we're talking about who, who looks down into the hearts of every person, and, and he's looking for these people, and he looks for this one, who's a trickster. He's a deceiver. And he wrestled, this man wrestled with God. This man would be from the line that the Messiah would come. I wonder how many times Jacob would have heard the promise that God gave to Abraham. That Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, and through this line, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And Jacob was like, I want that. I want that. I want to live into that new thing. I want to live into that new identity and that reality. I want to be a part of that. And the problem that Jacob had was that he was born in the wrong birth order. It wasn't his to be had. And so, Mr. Trickster, Mr. Deceiver, he have been that way his whole life, even before he was born, just lived into this, I'm going to achieve this reality. And so he came up with this plot, came up with this plan, and said, I want that identity, I want to go after it, I want to achieve this thing. And so he came up with this plan, and he tricked his father to give him his birthright. He tricked his brother to give up his standing for some food. This trickster, this deceiver, he's achieving, he's manipulating, trying to get what he wants. And God shows up in his life and literally breaks his head, transforms his life. Jacob, the deceiver, is now called by God 
as Israel, the man who wrestled with God. And I can just imagine, can't you see a Jacob walking around every moment of his life, every step of his life, after wrestling with God, not as a strong man who achieved everything that he was set out to do, but as a man with a limp, only moving forward because of what God had done in his life. How about another name change for us today in the scriptures? This time, what Jesus does with Simon, or you might know him as Peter. Simon got the name Peter when he boldly declared, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And with that bold, big mouth of Peter, Simon often put his foot in it. And we read throughout the scriptures and the stories of the Gospels that Peter, that Simon, was just always saying the strangest method, the exact opposite thing of what he should have said. Like, for example, we look at the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Peter was there. He left with a basket full of leftovers, and he saw God multiply almost nothing to feed so many people. It wasn't even 24 hours later where Peter is hungry and he is in a boat with Jesus and he is asking the very question, Jesus, we're going to die. We don't have any food. <laughs> like, what? What are you talking about, Peter? You just saw Jesus feed all these people. Come on, Simon. Come on. But what about when Jesus was walking on water? Peter said, oh, I will come out, and I'm going to walk with you on the water. I got some faith. And he gets out on the boat, and he realizes he doesn't have that much faith. And Jesus kind of pokes a little fun at him and says, you little faith are you. Come on, Simon. But this is us. In, in moments, where we're standing on the rock. Oh, our, our faith is strong. We're full faith in Jesus. And then with the very same mouth, with Simon saying the, the craziest thing. Have you ever fell asleep praying that God, I know it's bedtime, head's on the pillow, just want to talk to you because I know I'm supposed to pray to you. God, I just thank you for being so good to us. Just ask for a few minutes. <laughs> right, we all do that. We all do that. Peter did that. Mr. Bold Man. Or how about this little girl? This little girl comes up to Peter and says, Hey, are you a follower of Jesus? And Mr. Bold Peter says, ah, No, it's not, actually. Denies that he even knew Jesus. This guy just moments ago, they, he, he, they're in the garden. Jesus is arrested. Peter takes out his sword. Jesus is like, what are you doing? i got to get arrested. i got to get crucified. Peter's like, no, you don't. He cuts off one of the Roman guy's ears. He's just doing stuff that's completely opposite of this new identity that Jesus was trying to Give him. He's like, you're the rock, Peter. Come on, stop. Stop messing it up. Simon, stop saying dumb stuff. Stop doing crazy stuff. But God, in all of these instances, with Abraham, with Jacob, with Peter, he gives them, he gives us an identity that is received, that's not achieved. Because there is no possible way to achieve it. How can somebody who denies that they even know Jesus to a little girl stand up in front of thousands of people like 50 days later and preach 
an incredible message about how Jesus is the Messiah, and you've got to believe in him to have eternal life, and thousands of people get saved. There's only one answer to that question, and that, my friends, is the Holy Spirit. That's God working in his life, transforming his life, using him through all of his gifts and talents and also his Simon qualities that creep in and come out of our mouth and in our actions every once in a while. See, God looked into the heart of Simon and he saw Peter by the power of the Holy Spirit. God looked into the heart of Abram and saw Abraham. God looked into the heart of Jacob and he saw Israel. And God is looking into your heart too. And he knows absolutely everything about you. He knows what you struggle with. He knows the places where you fall short. And he also knows this in Jeremiah. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nation. The new you is the one God knew before you did. So as we grow individually, as we grow as a church, we need to know that God already knew us. God already knew this. God already knows what we are moving into. We are not creating this out of thin air. We're not manipulating things to try to figure it out, just flying by the seat of our pants. Right? God knew this. God knew you. And we need to learn to receive all that God has for us. We need to receive it. To receive it. And so today as we wrap up our sermon message today, I want to invite you to receive the identity that Jesus has for you. It's not, Kevin, it's not not good enough. It's not, I blew it. I got one more name tag. And I want to know what you would write on that name tag for your identity that you are receiving from Jesus. What would you write? There are numerous identity statements that God gives us in the scriptures. Pick one and write it on your name tag. And get rid of these other ones that you achieve and receive the new identity that God wants to give you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you bestow upon us the best, most truest identity of who we are. It comes from you, God. I pray today in this moment we would just say we receive it. We receive it. Maybe we need to even turn our hands up like this, like like it's raining and we just got to catch it. We receive it. We receive it. We're, we're, we're here to give everything that you want to give us. We're here to take in everything you want to send our way. And I'm done trying to climb that ladder. I'm done trying to fight to make this work. I'm done trying to figure out all the tricks and tips and make it all work. And I just want to receive who I am really made to be and continue to move into the new 
God has for me. I pray that we would be able, all of us, to pray that prayer today and every day. And may we receive the amazing life that you are continuing to work in our lives. Thank you, God.